Welcome back. Thank you for joining me every weekday and the early morning hours. We're typically here between um, <clears throat> 9, 9.30, 9.45 a.m. Mountain Time. Um, what I've been doing, well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Pamela Erlen, a mystic and channel of Christ Conscious Beings. And I've been um, taking this text here, which is a oneness text, it is a spiritual awakening text that gives a lot of guidance about how not to suffer. <laughs> Just simplifying it for you. It kind of, uh, the best way I can describe it is it, it's a great undoing for the mind. All of the ways that we have conditioned ourselves into pain in this lifetime. And it teaches also about divine reality and about the conditions in our reality that we've created as humans that make us suffer. And um, for me personally, it's done a lot in my life to relieve anxiety and I was a big warrior, sometimes still am. Um, not so much when, you know, I'm deeply delved into this text and getting guidance, you know, from Jesus, who is the person and being that we've been channeling along the way. So what we've been doing is reading the text, stopping and pausing for commentary from Jesus to speak about it. Um, and then, yeah, it's a day-by-day -day process. So today we're on uh, chapter 1, page 17, and we're starting at 1.6, for those of you who are following along. Um, I know some of you have been asking, you know, why it goes so slowly, but there is a lot to unpack here. It's almost as if the words and the verses of this text are having many meanings, and sometimes many meanings within one meaning. <laughs> I know that sounds like a contradiction. The mind likes to make everything into a contradiction. It even thinks that oneness is a contradiction. <laughs> um, but in the Kabbalion, it says the all is within the all. And any student who understands this is well along their way to awakening. Do you guys remember that? Alchemy students, hermetic students. So. Remember that, that um, in oneness, everything must be a part of the one. It's like gears in a machine, right? So if your mind tries to fight this text, it's probably because it's so used to separating everything and pulling everything apart, right? Okay, let's go to 1.6. It says, um, you should only be in a hurry. Excuse me, you should be in a hurry only to hear the truth. And of course, all the ways you act when you want to hurry are backward to what you would achieve. Let your worries come and let your worries go. Remember always that they simply do not matter except in terms of time and that you will save time by letting them go. Remember that your worries affect nothing. You think if your worries affect time, this is an effect, but time is an illusion. It too does not matter. Remind yourself of this as well. This is part of letting go of the old world to make way for the new. Realize these things do not matter and will not be carried to you, carried with you to the new world. So we might as well let them go. 1.7 says, it is as if you have carried your heavy luggage with you everywhere, just in case you might need something. <laughs> He stops and says, the heavy luggage is the worry. It is the lack of trust. When you have heavy luggage, you think that you could be preparing for the worst, but does that make you feel better to be in continual preparation, whether it be for the best or for the worst? Does that make you feel better um, to always be guiding your emotions in a way to tell your mind how it needs to feel, as opposed to just allowing it to unflow as it will and being present with it. Continuing on in 1.7, it says, now you are beginning to trust that you will not need these things you have carried. Ah, no heavy coat. <laughs> For you trust the sun will shine, that warmth will surround you. You are an immigrant coming to a new world with all of your possessions in hand. But as you glimpse what was once a distant shore and now is near, 
you realize none of what you formerly possessed and called your treasures are needed. How silly you feel to have carted them from one place to the next. What a waste of time and energy to have slowed down by such a heavy to have been slowed down by such a heavy burden. What a relief to realize that you need to carry it no more. How you wish you would have believed they were not needed when you began, and how happy you are now to leave them behind. He stops and says, Possessions are painful thoughts. It is a concept you've created that you need to do something with these painful thoughts, that they need to be processed, transmuted, mitigated, integrated. You've used many fancy words, um, as opposed to just allowing your thoughts to just go where they go, to just be where they are, and for you to be where you are right in them. How would that be different? The mind may say, that's horrible. I will feel terrible and it will never stop. But you can't be certain that that's true until you've tried it a time or two, hmm? All right, 1.8. You do not realize as yet how heavy was your burden. Had you literally carried a heavy and useless trunk from one world to another when you had been told by someone wiser that it would not be needed, you would, upon realizing the truth, ask yourself what else you had been told and disregarded. You might try one thing, one more thing, and then another that you previously would not have tried when you were so convinced that you were right and the other wrong. And as each new step is tried and found to work, your confidence in the wisdom of this teacher would continue to grow. He stops and says, when I say teacher, I mean spirit. And I won't define that for you because spirit cannot be encapsulated or limited by a word. But you will know when it's there. It's quiet, not loud. It feels and it directs. You may have thoughts in response to it, but it is not a thought. It will become apparent. Okay, moving on midway through 1.8 here on page 17 of chapter 1, it says, You might consider that you could still learn from your mistakes and find the learning in the end to be the same. And this surely might do from time to time. But eventually you would realize it would be quicker and easier to learn without mistakes. And eventually you would realize also that the wisdom of your teacher has become your own. He stops there and says, the teacher, spirit, brings about the light of realization that you have called Dharma. Dharma is the goodness innate in all things and when you're always looking for it as opposed to preparing for the worst, then the path of karmic learning and all of its painful repercussions are no longer required. This is the nature of what you are calling New Earth. In this world, for whatever you call it, fifth dimensional living, New Earth, New Gaia, many terms for the same, it is simply the realization that learning is not apparent or needed. Learning is painful. You are clinging to that old way. In Dharma, in this way of goodness, the goodness is so apparent that it overrides the need to learn. Remember, spirit doesn't learn, spirit doesn't think, but spirit can direct your thinking away from the pain of the karmic cycle. This is the first thing that's important, powerful, beautiful, and illuminating about what you are calling New Earth. In uh, 1.9 of chapter 1, it says, The urge to test another's wisdom is the urge to find your own way and have it be a better way. It is the urge not to trust the teacher in all things, but only in certain things. It is the desire to find your way on your own so that you can take pride in your accomplishment 
as if by following another's map, the sense of accomplishment in your arrival would be diminished. This wanting to do things on your own is a trick of the ego. Your pride, a gift. The ego demands. These are the magic thoughts that oppose miracle-mindedness. He said, let's stop and talk about what magic is in these terms. Magic is something that you see and then you don't. You can't actually evidence it. It feels good in the moment and then the show is over. Just like a magic show, it goes away. It can't nourish you. It's not lasting. It can't be real. Magic is full of wonder in the creative start of karmic implications and results can make the mind feel that it has accomplished something. But remember, the mind isn't the doer. That was the pain of the old world. In the new world, the doer is spirit. Let's continue on in 1.9, about midway through. It says, these are the thoughts that say, on my own, I am everything, rather than on my own, I am nothing. He stops and says, your ego will oppose the latter portion of that sentence. If you hold a belief that you are worthless and that you must evidence your worth in physicality, this sentence will cause you to think too much, to feel too painfully. When I say, on your own, you are nothing, nothingness is the deep lap of God, the deep void and abyss of all of the physicality that was formerly painful in the karmic laws of your world. When you let it go, you float around in that nothingness. You say, actually, I'm not the doer because there is no I. Ego will oppose that thought too. Do you feel that opposition in you? Continue forth if you're done with suffering. We can leave you to it if you like, but if you're done, continue with us. A true leader follows until she is ready to lead. She does not strike out on her own in the beginning before she knows the way. There's no shame in learning, no shame in following the course another has put forth. Each true course changes in application. 50 students may sit in a classroom being taught the same lessons and not one will learn in exactly the same way as another. This is true with the teaching and learning of, of information and true with the teaching and learning of truth as well. The only way that you can fail to learn the truth is to demand to learn it on your own. For on your own, it is impossible to learn. Resign as your own teacher. Accept me as your teacher and accept that I will teach you the truth. Find no shame in this. You cannot learn what I would teach you without me. You have tried in countless ways and can try still again, but you will not succeed. Not because you're not smart enough, not because you will not try hard enough, but because it is impossible. It is impossible to learn anything on your own. Your determination to do so only blocks the learning. It is only through union with me that you learn because it is only in function with me that you are your true self. This gift, oh wait, I skipped something. All of your effort is based on disbelief of this truth and your attempts to prove that this truth is not the truth. All that this effort brings you is frustration. All your seeming success from this effort brings you is pride to offer to your ego. This gift your ego demands is not worth the price you pay. The price of this gift is everything. He stops and says, the price of the gift of ego is your suffering. It will give you temporary mindfulness, temporary awareness, but it doesn't last for long. When I say you cannot learn without me, I mean the Christ consciousness, not simply me in the name that you know of as Jesus, but the essence of the Christ is what you are, and you cannot learn without that. I love you.